rest in assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. This morning I will be reading from John 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for forgiving our sins. We thank you for sending your Son that we may find redemption through him. Please bless everyone present and that we may live by your word. In your Son's name I pray. Amen. Right, hymn 329. Let's stand together. Grace greater than our sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mouth I've poured. There where the blood of the Lamb was spilled.
may be seated. You know, that hymn, you look down on the bottom and you see words by Julia Johnson and music by Daniel Towner. The words, Julia Johnson. You know, Julia was from Alabama. You know how you can tell? <laughs> look at the lyrics of that one. What's the first word that gives it away? Yonder. Okay. And then what's the other one? Crimson Tide. <laughs> Roll Tide. Roll Tide. <laughs> Roll tide. <laughs> I can't even sing <laughs> Okay, so before you start, hold on. So the layout of this one, just follow my lead. We'll figure it out as we go through. <laughs> All right, really very nice. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, y'all come on. Down. 
Ah, so children, come on. Solomon was the king of Israel after his father, David, died. God made Solomon very wise. Solomon began to build a temple for the Lord. Solomon ordered thousands of workers to help build the temple. They cut cedar logs and stone blocks. They laid a foundation and built the outside of the temple. God blessed the temple and promised Solomon, if you obey my commands, I will keep the promise I made to David. I will live among the Israelites and I will not abandon my people. The temple was built in seven years. It was beautiful. The cedar paneling inside the temple was carved with ornamental gourds and flower blossoms. Solomon overlaid everything inside the temple with pure gold. He hired men to make bronze furnishings for the temple, such as bronze bowls for holding water. When the temple was complete, Solomon moved the Ark of God from its place on Mount Zion to the new temple in Jerusalem. Solomon gathered the leaders of Israel. As the priests moved the Ark to the most holy place in the temple, King Solomon and the leaders sacrificed the sheep and cattle to the Lord. When the priests came out of the temple, a cloud filled the temple. God's glory was in the cloud. Solomon turned to speak to the Israelites. Praise God, he said. God promised David that his son would build a temple. God kept his promise. Solomon stood and prayed with his hands spread out toward heaven. There is no God like you, he said. Then Solomon thought about the future. He knew Israel would sin and make God angry again. So Solomon asked for forgiveness, and he asked God to hear their prayers. When Solomon had finished praying, he encouraged the Israelites to love and obey God. The people returned to their homes, joyful because God was good to them. The temple was a place where God met with his people. The people could go there to make sacrifices and worship God. Today, when we trust in Jesus, he is with us wherever we go. We can look to him for forgiveness and help. Morning. Good morning. So I only have two up here, but Brecklin has already assured me that it's going to be a good day because there's only two of them up here. I was like, okay, good. So today's story, we talked about Solomon. Do you remember Solomon from last week? Yeah, he was David's son, remember? So Solomon is now king, and he prayed to be what? Wise, right? He wanted to be wise. So he was praying to God to help him become wise. And then in the story today, Solomon built what? a temple. Do you know what a temple is? It's a place where, you know, God's people gathered and it's, it said that God met with those people and that he, you know, he was there. His presence was there. It's where they worshiped God. And so they built this temple, you know, they put the ark for God in there. And then, you know, also it said that God was going to keep his promises. And did God keep his promise? Yeah, he did. He told Solomon, he told David that he was going to keep his promises, and Solomon made the temple, and he did. And it also said, you know, that Solomon prayed, and he said, you know, pray that these people will continue to follow God and obey him and love him. And that's kind of like us, too. You know, we need to remember to, one, we can pray for wisdom to make smart choices, right, and do what God wants us to do. But also, we can love God and obey what he wants us to do, right? It's always good to to obey, right? Obeying parents and everybody. Yeah, I'm getting blank stares. <laughs> I guess that's to be. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, so love and obey God, right? So that's something for us to remember. Okay, if you will, please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for today, and I thank you for um, just this reminder of you know the faithfulness that Solomon had, Lord, and. The wisdom that you've given him to do your plan and to um, show that you keep your promises, Lord. I just thank you so much for the story of reminding us to um, always love and obey you, Lord, but to also love others. I just pray that we would take um, 
the good news and share it with other people, Lord, and show others your love, Lord. Um, be with us throughout this week and be with us during this service, Lord. And if there is someone here um, that doesn't know you, that they will come to know you, Lord. I just thank you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Zoom. Ow. You know, Lacey, as teachers, as fellow teachers, we know that blank stare. Yeah. Yeah. Teachers, raise your hand if you if you are. Yeah, yeah. You know how that how that is. You know, and I was going to make a uh, you know try to make a light moment of that, but that could become a sermon message. If you think about it, how many times have we been told over and over, and we just look back with that blank stare? So you know, it's like, oh me. You know, thank you for opening my eyes a little bit on what I was trying to trying to be funny about. And it's like, you know, you're missing, you're kind of missing the point here. So anyway, um, we are going to stand together for off door hymn. And then after we take the, the sing and take the offering, then uh, Brother Owen Lewis will be joining us for the message today. And, and um, I think Lucas, as he has instructed many times, is they can preach up to two hours. Uh, and then after that, I think it's a reduction of their grade uh, at Shorter. Uh, and they're, we're tag teaming as well, too, so we, we could go all, at least until 3.30 or 4 o'clock today if we've got messages for everybody. So we look forward to seeing what the Lord has laid on your heart, and, and I pray that we don't look back at you with blank stares as well, too. Let's stand together. Our offertory hymn this morning is The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for another day, Lord, another chance to come to your house and worship, Lord, and just hear a message, Lord, and hear your word. That's it. There are any here today that do not know your loving grace that when they hear this word today that they will be moved, Lord, and receive your wonderful gift of salvation. Lord, we ask your blessing on all that you do, Lord, and all in the world that need, need your help, Lord. We ask you to bless this offering, Lord, the gift and the giver. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
All right, Brother Owen, feel free to come up. And as uh, Brother Neil said, yeah, we don't have anything planned until about 4 o'clock, so you're good to go. So. <laughs> Good morning. It is uh, such an honor to be back. I don't know if y'all remember, but about a year and a half ago, I was here. Uh, so I got to speak. Dr. Butler asked me to speak here, and I was probably a little bit shorter. I had nothing but just decided I had no facial hair, and I was far less confident. And I was talking a lot faster, so completely different person now. But uh, going back to the uh, the points, uh, if I speak too long. Sadly, my schedule is too busy this year where I don't have a class of Dr. Butler, so I'll have no points deducted. So I could talk as long as I want. <laughs> but all jokes aside, it is such a blessing and honor to be back here. I just, Dr. Butler is so amazing, and his mentorship and guidance and teaching has meant a lot. Y'all have an amazing pastor, and so I just want to uh, thank him. But um, if y'all will join with me, we're going to turn to Hebrews, Hebrews 1, and while y'all are turning with me, I'd like y'all to think and reflect on a question with me. Uh, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, 1. And that is, if someone were to come up, with, come up to you, and to, could be in the streets, could be a friend, could be someone you meet at Walmart, and they were to ask you, who is Jesus? What would you say? If someone were to ask, who is Jesus? How, how could I know who Jesus is? How would you respond? This is very important for us to, to think about. One, just for the means of sharing the gospel. Because if we do not know who Jesus is or how we can talk about him, how can we share our faith? But more importantly than that, is that how we would tell people about Jesus shows our walk with God. If we just give a two-word a two answer, maybe we don't have the best walk with Jesus. But if we are... But if we talk about how he has led us through trials and we talk about who Jesus is in the Bible, this might show a greater walk in Christ. And so that is what we're going to be looking at today. Whenever we, how our answer of Jesus will reflect how we worship God, how we view him, and what our relationship is with him. Uh, Dr. Butler told me that right now y'all are going through the Ten Commandments. And so I figured this would be a good time for us to focus on who we are obeying. Because if we do not know who we are obeying, what's really the point? Is this just a meaningless task that we're doing because we're told? But if we know why we, who and why we're serving Jesus, the Ten Commandments and all of God's commandments become more than just obeying a command. It becomes an act of love. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And so hopefully, I hope after this exploration of Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, that we will be able to look at this passage and we could say, this is Jesus. And so whenever someone comes up to us and says, well, who's Jesus? We could say, well, let's look at Hebrews 1 and we could say, this is Jesus. But whenever we might be going through a hard trial and a difficult season of life, we could say, this is Jesus. This is the one who will carry me through. So let, if you will join me in the reading of Hebrews 1. God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. And these last days have spoken to us in his Son, who came appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made the purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited far more excellent name than they. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today, and I thank you just for the privilege of letting us to come to your house. Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather and to worship you and to learn about you, Father. I ask that you please speak to us today. Lord, help us to be willing to listen, Father, to, to put whatever stressors or anxiety at the door, Lord, and put them at your feet, Father, that we could solely focus on, so we could learn who you are and how this affects our walk and our relationship with you, Lord. Lord, please, if someone does not know you today as, as Lord and Savior and as Father, I ask that you please, you, you please convict their heart and you please put someone in their way to, tell, to share with them the gospel, Lord. Lord, I am just so thankful for you. So humbly pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. So before the author of Hebrews begins to really tell us who Jesus is, he starts with giving us a little bit of history. 
He says, God long ago spoke to us through the fathers and through the prophets. And when it says fathers, I believe he is referencing the fathers of not only the Jewish faith, but our faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see this clearly in Genesis Genesis 12, where he calls Abraham to follow him, telling him that he will bless him, and that through Abraham all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we see that this is fulfilled when Jesus Christ came. But I think it also means the father of all nations, Adam. And so in Genesis 3.15, God tells the serpent, and I will put enmity, which is hatred, I will put hatred between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and he shall bruise you, and he shall bruise on the head, and he shall bruise him on the heel. This is what is called the proto-gospel. This is the first time the gospel is mentioned in Scripture. Just a few verses after Adam and Eve have sinned, God is already telling them how he will save them, how he will redeem them. And that is through the son, the son of a woman okay, well, stomping the serpent's head, stomping the devil's head. The last time I stomped um, uh, when I tried to do that demonstration was in a gym, and I was on a stage, and it echoed really loud, so I was kind of scared to stomp there, so sorry about that. It, uh, <laughs> but this has been passed on, this message of one, God using Abraham's family to bless the nations, but also God stomping out the serpent, stomping out sin, has been passed on through the prophets, as through Moses and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Nahum. And it has come to the writers of Hebrews, he says, and this has been pro- in many portions, in many ways, and these last days has spoken to us in his Son. We see that all of human history has been leading up to Jesus. All of human history has been leading up to be about Jesus, and all of human history points back and points equally points back and equally looks forward as we wait for him to return. And so, as though we see that first, all of history is about Jesus. But next, what do we see about it? That he is his son. Jesus is God's son. And I think this is something that we can overlook at times, and that we can over that we could uh overlook and maybe not give that much attention to because we've heard this through all of our lives that Jesus is God's son. Well, duh. But there's a lot of important details in there. If God has a son, then that must mean that life is found in God. How can a father be a father if he does not have the ability to give life? Because Jesus is God's son tells us that there is life found between Jesus and God, that there is life there for them and there is life for us to go to him. Before God was creator, before he made the world, before he was king, before he was the judge, God was a father. And we see that because if we're looking at the Trinity, that they've existed before all of time, that there was that father. And it's important, though, not to say that Jesus was created, for he has always been, we see this in Hebrews 7, 3, neither that Jesus has neither beginning of days nor the end of life, but the father is continuously giving life and with that, there is this intimate relationship. Uh, after being baptized, God responds to Jesus. He says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He says that in Matthew 4.18. Then in John 5.30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but from the will of him, the Father who sent me. The Father's and the Son's relationship is marked by love, delighting in each other, serving one another, having faithfulness to each other, and having obedience and and service to one another. This relationship, knowing that Jesus is God's Son, tells us that Jesus is loving and that He is faithful and He is relational. He's not some king on high that we cannot go to, that we don't relate to, or doesn't relate to us, but He is someone who wants to know you intimately. Let's keep going. In verse 2, the author says that Jesus was appointed heir of all things. Let's define heir. Heir means to inherit, to possess. Someone who is entitled to the property or the rank of someone else. Here we see the father's love for the son is that he is willing to give him all that he has, which is everything. This is both a physical and a spiritual matter. 
physically, God has given Jesus, he has given them all of creation, all of earth, nature. He has given them the kingdoms, the nations, and the people. Spiritually, he has given him heaven and the beauties and the angels that is found there. We see this more realized in John 17, 24, where Jesus prays. He says, Father, I desire that they also, speaking of the disciples, whom you have given me, be with me wherever I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus has also inherited God's glory and honor and majesty. But you may be saying, Owen, if Jesus is an heir, does that mean God has died? Because in our society, normally, if someone is an heir, they receive their inheritance after someone has passed away. I think it's a reasonable question. But in, while talking to Nicodemus in John 30, 35, Jesus says, The Father loves the Son and has given him all things into his hands. Jesus has always had all things. He is, he, from the moment he's been appointed from, all, from eternity past, he has had all things before the foundation of the world. Jesus is the heir of all things. He is the owner of the universe. Verse 2 continues that he says that he, that he, uh, that he is through him all things were made. Who, through him the world was made. Jesus is the agent of creation. And when I say agent, I don't mean James Bond or some secret agent. But instead I mean a means at which something was accomplished. That, this, that Jesus, through Jesus, the agent of creation, everything was made. Uh, Colossians 1.16 says that for him, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and visible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And we even see this in Genesis. In Genesis 1.3 it says, then God said, but well, what does John tell us? John tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see Jesus in the third verse of Genesis, that we see that God speaking, and that saying, let there be light, and Jesus creating with the light being made. Jesus does not do what the Father says because he is his subject, or because he is obligated to, but Jesus obeys God because of his love for him. It is relational. It is because that God loved, because Jesus loves God that Jesus has made the world through God commanding him. Jesus is the agent of creation, the creator of the cosmos. I love, I, I'm getting excited. I love verse 3. This is when it gets, starts getting better. And it says here that he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Radiance is a word that we don't use a lot, and we might think it, mean, it might be kind of similar to radiation. But radiance means the rays or the reflecting beams of light that are that are they're vividly bright and they are vividly shining. Let's imagine the sun, S U N, not S O N, and how it gives off light. We know that wherever the light follows, where the sun follows, wherever the light moves. We're not going to have this big light in the middle of town whenever the sun is down. The, sun, the light follows where the sun moves. And wherever that light hits, it changes things. Whenever the light hits a car, it is heated up and it's unbearable to get into. Whenever the, whenever the light hits us, it keeps us warm, or right now, hot and sweaty. Or whenever we place ice or snow outside, when the sun hits it, it melts. The light changes things. That light is the radiance, and that is what Jesus is. Jesus is God's radiance, God's light. Wherever God is, Jesus shines. Wherever that light is, it changes things. We see this plainly in John 8, 12, where Jesus says, he, he is the light. He says, I am the light of the world. The Son's light is from the Father, and His radiant beams are shining on us. Wherever God moves, Jesus moves, and his spirit moves. So we see that whenever God's light is, shine on, is shown onto someone, that lives are changed, that life is given, life is altered, that there is now purpose. Because Jesus is shining God's glorious light, people are changed. Jesus is the beam of God's glory. 
He is shining and changing lives through God, showing him where to go. But verse 3 continues. He says that he is the exact representation of his nature. Jesus is the exact representation of God. He perfectly reflects the one who begate him, yet he's always existed. Doesn't that hurt your head a little bit? That God perfectly is, lives as his son, that he is, but yet he's always existed? He, is, he demonstrates the Father's gentleness, patience, mercy, faithfulness. He demonstrates his understanding, kindness, loving grace. But he also demonstrates the Father's righteousness, holiness, wrath, and judgment. Uh, Colossians 1.15 tells us that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We have been made in God's image. Jesus is, is God's image. So whenever Jesus says that he is the one who has seen the Father in John, uh, whatever has seen me sees the Father in John 14.9, that is because he physically is God's representation. We are to represent him, but that's because we are, to, we are like him. We are made in his image, but Jesus physically is it. He is the exact representation, betraying, perfectly betraying his father's traits. And verse 3 says that he continues that he, Jesus, upholds all things by the word of his power. He upholds all things by the words of his power. Um, I've often heard God compared to as a watchmaker. Um, that God, at the beginning of creation, made this nice, detailed, complex watch. And whenever he was done with creation, he wound it, wound it up, and he started the watch, and he just put it down, and he left it. That's not an accurate view of God. Because God did not just make this watch, and he put it down, but he kept messing with it. He kept making sure the watch was in check. Jesus is actively involved with us. He is actively involved with his creation, upholding it. He tells us, we see this really great in Job 38, and forgive me, I didn't uh, mark this, so we, we might go on a bit of a journey. In Job, we get a really good idea of this at the end where Job was beginning to really question God. He says this in Job 38, 38, 12, he says this, Have you, uh, how, uh, how you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, and that the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like the clay under the seal, and they stand forth like a garment, for the wicked is in their light and withheld from the upbroken arm. We see that God is over the, the morning and the light and the wicked, and we see this more with the, uh, verse 39. He says, can you, hunt the, can, you, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of young lions? when they crouch in their dens and when they lie and wait in their lair? Who prepares the raven for its nourishment? And when the young, when it youngs cry to God and wonder about without food, God is the one who makes the sun come up. God is the one who, who has the trees grow, the one who takes care of the tides whenever, for the ocean. He's the one who's the pharaoh, who feeds the sparrow, the one who beautifully wraps the lilies of the field. And he is the one that ensures that we are not crushed by gravity or that the earth is perfectly placed in our solar system. He is the upholder of the universe. He is actively doing this. For this, this is effortless for him. This is just, just God effortlessly working. He, through Jesus, we are fed, clothed, and provided for. And that this is equally big and personal. On a, on a huge scale, we know that he provides for humanity. But on a personal scale, he makes things work that should not work. Time, meetings that we didn't think we would make, being late to work, making ends meet where we didn't think ends would be made. This is where God is upholding the universe on a macro, huge scale with all of creation, but on a personal scale with you and I. He upholds the universe and he is maintaining all things throughout the cosmos. We see that this is Jesus the one who all of history has led up to, the very Son of God, the owner of all things, the agent of creation. He is the beam of God's glory and the exact representation of God, the upholder of the universe. 
But look at the end of verse 3. When he had made the purification of sins. That is the cross. And Jesus, looking at his resume, looking how he, all of history is about him, knowing that he is the Son of God, knowing that he is the heir of all things, knowing that he is that creation was made through him, knowing that he was the beam of God's glory, he looked at all these things and he said, this is not for me to selfishly keep or to selfishly use for myself, but this is something that I must willingly give. And he willingly gave up all of these things to die on the cross. He saw this list and he said it did not matter. I'm going to sacrifice myself on the cross for the rebellious evil ones who have rejected me. Jesus took God's wrath in our place. It takes an eternity, forever, for someone to endure God's wrath if they do not know Him. But Jesus took all of it in six hours. We, I don't know if we'll ever be able to fully wrap our minds around how much Jesus sacrificed how much Jesus gave up, how much Jesus put behind him in order to willingly, to selflessly, to humbly, lovingly come down to earth and to willingly sacrifice himself for us. This is Jesus, the one who selflessly did not regard his status as God as something to be selflessly exploited, but one who willingly came and left heaven, emptied himself, and lived his life as a humble servant and died on the cross for criminals. This is Jesus. It is, this is how he is equally all these all-powerful things, but yet so loving and personal. Verses, the end of verse 3 says that when after he made the purifications of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much more excellent than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Jesus was more than worthy to take this from, to take this, this honor, to take the glory, to take the, the worship for giving his life on Calvary, to have a better name than all the angels. This is who Jesus is. He is the while he is what all history is about, son of God. But we can't change these things. This is a fact. But what can change is your relationship with him. Jesus is called all of these mighty things, but he's also called several personal things. We might know in our head that Jesus made creation, that Jesus is God's image. But do you know in your heart that Jesus is your friend? In John 15, 15, he says, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Do you know him as a brother? John 19, 27, Jesus said to her, said to Mary, Stop clinging to me, for I have not ascended to my father. But go tell my brothers. And say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Do you know him as an advocate, someone who goes to God on your behalf? 1 John 2.1, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Do you know him as Redeemer? Titus 2.14, Jesus says, Jesus who gave himself to be, gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed. And do you know him as Savior? Ephesians 5.23, as Christ also is at the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. This is how we should know Jesus. Paul tells us in Philippians 3 that, that, he, that he was willing to forsake all that was in his past, him being the this great leader of the Pharisees, being the Hebrew of Hebrews, being so righteous and so zealous that he was willing to kill Christians. He says, this is all rubbish. When we look at the Greek, this literally means dung. This is all rubbish in knowing the surpassing value of knowing God. That same word knowing there, when we look at the Greek version of 
the Old Testament, it's the same word as Adam knowing his wife in Genesis 3. That, sure, this is important for us to know all these physical things about Jesus, but it truly means nothing if we do not know him as friend, if we do not know him as brother, if we do not know him as advocate, redeemer, savior, because if we do not know him as these things and we go up and say, oh, you're Jesus, you're the son of God, you're the owner of creation, we've done all these things for you, he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Do you have a relationship with Jesus this morning? Do you have a relationship with the one who has made all things? Do you, know, do you have a relationship with the upholder of the cosmos? This is what, this is how we know who Jesus is. If he is our friend, our brother, advocate, redeemer, savior, and because of that, our life has changed. We no longer just do things meaninglessly. We no longer have no point in life, but we have purpose, and that is to lovingly follow Jesus. And so, I leave you with that this morning to reflect on. If this is how you know Jesus, because if not, you could come talk to me. I'm sure all the deacons would love to talk to you about what it means to be saved and how to do so. But at its core, knowing Jesus is not just a head knowledge. It is not just intellectually knowing our Bible verses. But it's about having an intimate relationship. I'll leave you on this. Do you come to church? Is your relationship with Jesus fast food? Do you come to church and get your happy meal or do you go home and spend time with Jesus? Do you go home and have a feast with God, have a filet mignon, having salmon, having shrimp, whatever your favorite meal is? Do you have that with Jesus, or do you just come to church on Sunday to get your happy meal? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today, and I thank you for allowing us to be here. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to hear your word. Lord, I ask that you please move in us now that we are willing to change, willing to be changed by you, willing to listen, Father. So, Lord, please just move within us now that we will do your will, Lord, and that we will have a relationship with you, Father, and have a better walk with you. Lord, please just bless us as we leave here, Lord, that, that our walk is just not a Sunday morning, but it's every day as we seek you, seek you in prayer and word, Father. Lord, please help us to share our faith with others. Help use us, Lord, for the upbuilding of your kingdom, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we love you. We humbly pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.
school, so that's going to be an adjustment uh, to them and their families to keep them in their prayers. Um, also, look around today. We've got some people that aren't here. Uh, maybe they're at work, maybe they're traveling. Maybe they're going through things that we don't know. So just say a prayer for those people. Uh, and then uh, nothing else, Brother Neil. Yep. So we'll see you tonight, uh, the video that Brother Lucas has left, left for us to watch, and then choir practice afterwards. So do, do plan on joining tonight. Any other announcements? All right, let's sing The Family of God. <clears throat> I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God.